continuing in our series today, Blessed to Bless. Um, and the idea is living, uh, living in the reality of Elisha's double portion. Um, two weeks ago, we, we talked about grace. Last week, we talked about giving. And, and for those of you who were here last week, you got to experience a three-preacher sermon. And someone said, was it really 45 minutes long? And yes, it was really 45 minutes long. I, some of you said it didn't seem like 45 minutes. So we're going to try, and we, we've had the bar set high, so we're going to try and do the same. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Seriously. <laughs> Today's sermon will be much shorter than last week's. Um, but we're talking about generosity. And not just uh, generosity of our stuff, but generosity of our lives. Uh, and we're going to be looking at two texts, one from 2 Kings chapter 2 and another from Luke 14. But as we prepare to go to the book, will you bow with me in prayer? Father God, once again we come to your holy word. We come to the written word. Not just to see written words, not just to learn, not just to understand, but we come to the written word so that we might encounter the living word, your son Jesus. Lord, make that our goal as we come into this sermon time. Make that our desire to meet the living word face to face. And then just like others, when we meet the living word, Help that meeting transform us. Help that meeting change us. Help that, that meeting make us different somehow. We look into your book today to explore this topic of, of generosity. And not, as I said, not just generosity of our stuff, but generosity of our lives. So as we, as we come to the text, help us be prepared to learn how to live in a way that impacts others. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the text will be up on the screen. Our first is from 2 Kings 2, 19 through uh, actually 21, 22. Um, so let's just dive in. One day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my lord, they told him. The town is located in pleasant surroundings, as you can see. But the water is bad, and the land is unproductive. Elisha said, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with its water, and threw the salt into the water. And he said, this is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. And the water has remained pure ever since, just as Elisha said. And our second text is from Luke 14. And this is Jesus speaking. He said, salt is good for seasoning. But if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good for neither the soil nor the manure pile. It's thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So in our, our second Kings text, we have what has been called the first public miracle of Elisha. Um, if, you, if you think back to the story, the, the mantle has been passed. Elijah has been taken up in the chariot of fire and his, his mantle has fallen to Elisha. Elisha has taken the mantle. He's parted the river. He's returned to the, 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 the other side of the Jordan River. And he's basically living. He's hanging out. He's spending time in Jericho. And that brings us to today's text. The, the residents of the city come to him. They come to Elisha. They probably by this point have heard from the, from the company of prophets, the 50 prophets who, who were following Elijah and Elisha, that uh, he's the new head guy. 
He's the new top dog. He's the, he's the new lead prophet, if you will. The mantle of Elijah has passed to Elisha, and they've probably heard this by now. So the residents come to him, and, and they're not happy. They're not happy because even though the city is well situated, even though it's in a, in a beautiful area, it doesn't have a good water supply. As a matter of fact, the water supply is not just not good, it's bad, it's unhealthy. It brings death and infertility. And they make a request of this new prophet. They say, hey, fix this, please. Make it better. Make this wrong right. Now, we need to, we need to kind of gain a grasp on that request. Um, we live in a time and in a society where we walk to the sink, we flip the tap, and fresh water runs out. And it's not just fresh water, but it's water that has been filtered and purified and cleansed and then chemically treated so that nothing can grow in it. And sometimes it tastes a little too much like chlorine, but it's fresh, clean water. Pastor Bill titled his, his sermon, the, uh, the Original Culligan Man. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of clever, but really this is more than the Culligan man. These people are living a substandard life because they don't have a good water supply. This isn't just a case of hard water that leaves a milky cloud on your clear glasses. This isn't just a case of water that doesn't leave your clothes soft enough after you've done your laundry. This is a case of water, an essential for life, that is to them essentially deadly. Now there are commentators who, who describe how toxic the water must have really been. And even Elisha's words give us a clue because after the water is healed, he said it will no longer bring death and infertility. This is not about having your sweatshirt come out of the wash a little too rough. This is about water that brings death, that brings infertility. So he's asked to fix this wrong. It's not just to make the water drinkable. The request is for him to fix and bring fullness of life. Think about what, what would you do if you had no water? Do we have any campers in the area? I'm not talking RV campers. I'm talking Appalachian Trail, backpack, carry it all on your back campers. No. Okay. Here's, here's, here's a question. Do you all know the rule of threes? This is kind of a weird survival thing, but the rule of threes is you can live three minutes without air. You can live three days without water. And there's other threes that go on, but three days without water, you die. Water is essential, and they're saying, we need, we need an essential thing in life here. We need you to bring fullness of life to our city. So Elijah calls for a new bowl with some salt in it. Now, both of our stories have this common element. Both of our stories, both of our scriptures have the element of salt. But salt is not really what we want to focus on. Salt is just our starting point. In this Old Testament passage, Elisha uses salt as a way to heal the water supply of Jericho. But the story is not so much about salt as much as it is about Elisha and his willingness to engage with the people and have their lives become full, to, to engage in healing. He's asked to take care of this essential of life. It's also interesting that this happens in an area where salt is not something that they would have typically thought of as a healing agent for water. Um, Jericho is only seven miles from the Dead Sea. 
It's called the Dead Sea because there is so much salt in it, approximately 34% salt, that animal life does not live in this body of water. There's so much salt that it brings death. So they knew a little something about toxic water, and they knew a little something about salt causing water to be toxic. But Elisha asked for salt so he could heal their water. He, he takes the salt, and he cures the spring. And Scripture says it is to this very day known. It, it, it still is pure to this very day. And even today, if you go to Israel... In the city of Jericho, there's a place called Elisha's Spring, and it's still part of their water supply. They now draw from Elisha's Spring through pipes instead of through buckets. So Elisha heals the water. And then, then we look into our New Testament passage. And this passage, this statement that Jesus made about salt, comes on the, the tail end of a, of a discourse that he's having with people who are would-be disciples. In Luke 14, 25, there's this large crowd following Jesus. Now, he had crowds that followed him all the time. And sometimes, you know, I, I get a sense that maybe there was a little annoyance with the crowds because he taught them and they didn't get it and they didn't get it and they didn't get it and they didn't get it. And I'm not sure this is annoyance on his part. Because, you know, he was perfect, and I'm not sure he really got annoyed, but I think he wanted to call them to some hardline accountability. And he turns around, and he faces the crowd, and he delivers one of his hard sayings. If you want to follow me, you have to hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brother, your sister, even yourself. You have to put me first, Jesus said. And if not, you can't be my disciple. I mean, that's how this discourse starts. He turns and basically says, if you want to follow me, you have to hate everyone else by comparison, including yourself. You have to consider your own life forfeit. And then at the end of the discourse, he talks about salt. And he says, salt that loses its saltiness is useless. Elisha is, is willing to use his newfound double portion uh, in, in healing the water in Jericho, in, in interacting with the people, in, in bringing healing to their lives. And it's, it's not about being the Culligan man. It's about providing life to the people, not just water, but full life, healthy life. He's called to impact the people, to have an effect on those around him as a way of representing God to them. Jesus picks up this theme in Luke. He tells us that we're supposed to be the, the salt in people's lives. We're supposed to add flavor to the life of those around us. Jesus promises life to us, not just life, but life to the full, life overflowing. He promises us a life with flavor. But in turn, we're supposed to flavor the lives of those around us. We're to be to others what Jesus has been to us. And then Jesus gets a little edgy with us, doesn't he? If we've lost our ability to impact others, if we've lost our ability to flavor their lives, Jesus says we are useless. Good only to be thrown away. Not suitable for the soil or even the manure pile. Just disposed of. So what do we do with these stories? Uh, Elisha willing to be called upon to heal the community in which he's living. Um, Jesus calling us to affect those around us like salt flavors food. In these stories, we're called to be generous. Not generous with our stuff, generous with our lives. We're called to live among people, and by living among them, make a difference. I had a friend in seminary that said, I'm saved to serve. You know, people would ask him about his calling, and that was his very short, very concise reply. I'm saved to serve. 
How many of us who have accepted Christ, who are born again, who are saved, who are justified, whatever term you wish to use, how many of us look at that like the golden ticket? You know, we have arrived. How many of us look at life in Christ as if it was fire insurance? How many of us look at life in Christ like a get-out-of-jail-free card? Yeah. Jesus promised those things. He promised us life eternal. He promised us heaven instead of hell. He promises us to set us free. But he also promised us life here and now. Life to the full, life overflowing. And when our lives are overflowing, guess what? They're going to splash out on people around us. There's going to be some people around. If our lives are overflowing, there's going to be some people that get wet because of that. Life is an over. Have you ever thought of life as an overflowing commodity? And this is an issue of generosity. Generosity of ourselves. Two weeks ago, we explored the idea of, of the grace that Jesus brings to us. Last week, we looked at the ability to be a giver instead of a taker, instead of someone who grabbed on things and held on to things. That same impact that Jesus has on our, on our giving and on us through his grace causes us to be generous. Or to be like Elisha. We're supposed to add value, health, benefit to the lives of those around us. We're supposed to be like salt. We need to add flavor to people's lives. Let's pray that as disciples of Jesus, we do just that. Let's pray that we enhance the lives of the people that we meet by being generous with our own lives. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these examples. We thank you for the fact that sometimes Jesus got edgy with people and he said things like, if salt has lost its flavor, it's not even good for the crap pile. It's not even useful to be thrown on the manure pile. It's just discarded and trampled underfoot. Lord, we ask you to continue to challenge us in how we live our lives. Challenge us so that we understand that our lives, when they overflow with your grace, they become a, a generous gift to others. A way to flavor their lives, not with who we are, but flavor their lives with who you are. Help our lives overflow in a way that, that brings others to you. In a way that, that adds zest to their lives. In a way that helps their life as well become overflowing to others. We thank you that that's what you call us to. We ask for strength and encouragement to live that way. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as the uh, band comes back up, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges I would leave you with if you, if you uh, want to do a little exploration this week, just do a word study on salt. <laughs> You'll be studying most of the week, trust me. There are some, some interesting things about salt that I didn't even...